welcome to another Woodworking Wisdom. So hopefully you've realised that Colwyn's not here, someone different. Um, I'm Jason. I'm normally doing possibly the hand tools or the sharpening. So somehow I got volunteered to come into here and do a bit of wood turning. How difficult can it be? You, you push your chisel in. Um, not only that, they give me the scope of can we make a little box? So going to be kind of interesting on what we do with a little box. So we've got our lid. And take it on and off okay so hopefully that should be all okay so we've got our wood so this one's a bit of ash so just bear with me just going to grab what we're going to play with today so got our timber this is piece of laburnum okay so our timber is piece of laburnum now don't have to use this but i need something that is dry well seasoned yeah it's going to work nicely next thing we're going to work spindle work for this. So the grain is running with the orientation of the laid bed. Has got to be dry as the power mount thing. No point in using anything damp. Doesn't have to be a log material. It can be something, uh, a bit of ash, anything like that. All right. But like I said, we've got this at the moment. It's quite nice to play with. Someone's going to say it's a bit toxic. I've got an air cleaner going. When we sand, we're going to have the extractor going. So I'll get rid of that. Size of the bank. Okay. Hopefully you can see this. Let's get a camera free a minute then. Okay, so Ben's doing the camera, Craig's doing the question. So this is 110 mil diameter, roughly, or sorry, 110 mil long, 75 mil diameter, approximately. It's not critical, okay? Don't go over four inch for a box, though. Why that? Because you've got to get your hands over the front. Over four inch makes it difficult to take the lids on and off. And the ladies tend to buy the boxes more than the gents, so therefore they've got smaller hands. So three inch diameter is a nice size. For some of you who are older generation or maybe work in those other metric or imperial measurements, so we've got imperial written on this side for you. This is four inch, a tad and a smidgen long. Why about three inch diameter, okay? Inches, that's, that's difficult, isn't it? You break that down into 64ths, why? Okay, what we have done with this, we've marked the middle. So we've got a center dot on there, just quickly drawing that on with a pencil. So we're gonna mount this between centers. So for drive center, I've got stub center, or all right, pro drive. So it's got spring loaded, lots of teeth. Tail stock center, we're gonna use a ring center, okay? So Ben's on camera too. Ben, can we go to free for me a minute, please? Okay, fantastic. Now, my ring center is this one. It's got center point, it's got a ring around the edge, okay? Very commonly used in here, Carl will use it a lot. We're gonna put that in the tail stop. What I don't want is a single point center. This will split the wood fibers, what I'm doing, and it will damage them. So some of my boxes where I make finials can cause real problems. So quite important that I have something that's not gonna cause that damage. I'm not saying this doesn't work, but for the type of area I'm working with, don't want that. So I'm gonna put that out of the way. So we've already marked up our bit of wood. We're just gonna slide this along. Need to find our middle, got a dot there. Got a center point there. Load it between centers. Tighten up, get a rock with your hands. Just see what's happening. If it's too loose, you'll get a bit of play. Just gonna bring it up, lock off everything handle-wise. See what's going on. That feels nice and firm. Tool rests we're going to bring in. Now we've got one of those robust tool rests with that nice clearance, which will be great for this. I want to be just below centre height, about a quarter of an inch below. Turn the work over by hand. See what happens. Look everything off nice and firm. First thing we're going to do is take this down to a clean cylinder. So first thing I need to do, goggles go on. Okay, so we've got those on. We are going to want a spindle roughening gouge, three quarter inch, quite large. All right, so we can take this down to a cylinder. Next thing we've done is take the lathe speed down. So on, I can dial the speed up. So gently come up. Gonna spin about 2000 RPM. Finger and thumb, left hand, go on the tool rest. Chisel, we'll sit on the top. Handle will come low towards the floor. So we make contact, no cut. We raise the handle up, we find our cutting point. We can go along. Backwards and forwards, not too much pressure with your hand on the tool rest. Allow it to slide nice and gently. All the way along. 
dog. I will say I checked the bank over before we start. Wasn't any loose fur. Nothing that's hopefully going to flow. Not quite to a cylinder yet. I can tell by watching the camera in front of me here that still got a little bit of bow up. Let's have a look. Now we can have a feel. Sit on the top to give way. Tell us what's happening. Turn that off. Look. So we got a little bit of bark here. Not too much. This isn't too dusty. Was one of the things that I was worried about. So it looks quite nice. Down to a straight cylinder. So we're done with our spindle roughening gouge. We then need a set of calipers. We also going to want our chuck. So there. we've got a set of H shores in here, exactly the same as Colwyn used last week. We've got a serrated tooth on the edge that you can see there better. Good. Going to drop them back down. I want to come in just a little bit. I want about a quarter of an inch gap in between our calipers. I want to measure that, set that up. All right, this is easier to do on the bench. But I want you to see what's happening. We're taking the internal measurement. We can move the tool rest in. Cut down that overhang. We then need 3-8 beading tool. Okay. So we're going to do a spigot cut either end. So start the handle low. We're going to do a peel cut. Give our hand a little bit. Now we want to come down to that diameter. Let's have a look, see where we are. A little bit to go. Okay, bear with me, Craig. Let me just get this one done, then we're going to go. Get a measurement. Okay, Craig. Yep, got a quick question. Um, what wood is that you're using? This is laburnum, okay? So an ornamental tree in the UK. In the States, for the guys watching over there, this is golden chain tree. So we do our spigot either end. That's pretty good. Okay. So we've got spigot on both ends. Now, this is piece of laburnum log, okay? So, branch material, which means I get that lovely white set with all the way around the outside, dark centre. One of my favourite English woods, okay? If you get stuff like this, contact your, your local tree surgeon, maybe. If they're taking stuff this, down like this, it's worth actually putting this aside, nice long lengths, okay? Not short stuff. Keep it as long a lengths as you can, stand it up, let it season. This has been drying for two or three years. So, actually done, you know, it's down to that nice state now. It's air dried. Longer lengths mean any splitting on the ends you're going to remove when you cut that to length. If you cut it to short lengths and stack it underneath your lathe, you're going to lose three or four inches off each end. So longer lengths are better. So we've done our hard work now. So we're going to move a few things about. We need our knockout bar. It's up on there. Tap that out. Going to want to remove our tailstock in a second. The chuck can go on, wind it over. We're going to put that one on there. Now, I'm just looking at our blank what we got. I want to get the lid first. Now, I've got these two funny bits on here. I don't know if you can really see them. Let's get a craze camera on for a second. Okay, see those two little knots? They're quite a nice feature. If we put it in the lid, we're going to lose that. If we put it in the base, it's going to be more apparent. So, more like to put that in the base, turn it around, anything else. Ah, okay. So, base, lid. So, the lid is going into the chuck. Turn it up. Nice and firm. Put our chuck key back on the wall down there. Then want pencil, which I know I've got in here, and ruler. Now, some of the boxes I do, different sizes. Um, proportion is one thing I always tend to get asked when I go and do something. It's roughly what you got. So I either work on two thirds and one third, so one third for the lid, or two fifths and three fifths for the base and lid. This one is the later, so this is two fifths and three fifths for the base. Okay, so we've already split them out, we've drawn a pencil line on. Weird thing, we're doing the pencil line. Turn it away from you. 
you turn the work towards you, I snap the pencil. So if we turn it over, much better. Okay, so Rob, now one thing I haven't done, bring the tailstock up. If I bring the tailstock up, that's providing pressure. It's pushing on the tool wheel as we part this. We're gonna separate the lid and base. We're going to use nice small parting tool. This is 1 16th. This is a standard tool off the shelf, okay? Ben, can we get a free for me, please? Thanks, okay? So, let's just give you something we can look at this with, okay? So, 1 16th chisel. You can see it's got a weird grind underneath. Originally, this came up to a long point. I put this secondary curve underneath on the bottom, so that allows us there, it would have come up to a nice long point, okay? So I've deliberately got hollow grind on the top, curve pointing underneath. The reason for the curve pointing underneath adds more strength to the cutting tip. All right, so a little bit of grinding to do when I've done that one, but actually shaped it to do a task and it holds that tip longer and stronger, if you like, is really probably the better phrase. Okay, good. So, got our parting cut to do. So first thing I'm gonna do, get our tool rest nice and near. I've even moved up nearer to the chuck jaws. I'm trying to get my center stem in underneath nearer that cut. Lock everything off nice and firm. Now, as we said, we haven't brought the, the tail stock up. That's gonna provide pressure. I don't want that, that will burn the wood fibers. Now we're gonna do two cuts. Um, now this is the curve, the underside is the shorter cut. All right, overhead bend, good, right? So the long curve on the top is sat on the tool rest. I go in, put my pencil line. Now it's not one continuous cut. I wiggle my hand back and forwards a little bit. I'm opening the cut up. I'm trying to keep the heat to a minimum. Okay, we're being quite a narrow cut. I want to see what's going on. A little bit of paper and underneath on the lay bed is a really good tip. Now go as far as you feel safe. You can part this all the way off, but if you're not aware of what's happening, you throw it around the workshop, okay? It's a little bit embarrassing at a demo. So, on here, I'm just gonna get a little handsaw. I've moved the banjo out the way, give myself a lot of clearance to get in there, cut that off. So we've got our two bits, the base, the lid. We want the lid first. Next thing we're going to do, move the tail stock. It comes a danger. So that tail stock centre, we can take it out. But in my case, easier to move the banjo, gives me more clearance. Oh. Now we're going to work and hollow out the inside. So a few things I need. Okay, first thing then, depth gauge. I want to know how deep we can go. So I can set that up. I've left a bit on here, which hopefully you might be able to see if I draw a line on. I'm up to there, overhead, okay? That gives you a good idea. We've also got material in the chuck. So the material actually comes all the way up to where this ends on the depth gauge. So I've got a good three quarters of an inch more if I need it, but want something there. So I've set the depth gauge. We're gonna mark the centre, drill a hole. Craig, what have you got? Um, yeah, just a quick question from Woodwork Learner. Um, will you be using the Colwyn Way signature skew chisels Don't need today? that, sir. No, I'm sorry. So we've got my own skew. Um, gonna go over this while we stop, might as well have a look. We have oval skew section. This is slightly thicker and stronger than the normal oval skew. Weird thing with this, no handle, why? It's lighter. I don't use this for heavy, aggressive cuts. We don't need these big, heavy ash handles on this. So nice and light, right? easy to balance. Point thick section, as we said. Proper able skew has a flat on one edge, comes around to a curve on the other. This also has a very weird grind. Bend number three for me. Let's see if we can show Craig over here where he's got, okay? Now on here, we have a hollow grind on the top and it's rounded underneath, an asymmetric grind. This is all about adding more strength to the cutting tip for certain cuts. This came about from a trip many, many moons ago I did to Australia and used some desert materials. It broke my tip off when I wanted to do one cut. So hence the fact it's got that weird grind. To sharpen, 
I go up and down on the grinder wheel to do the curve on the back. On the top, it's hollow, like you normally would. Quite easy to do. But like I said, the major thing with this, no handle makes it lighter to operate. I haven't got that weight dragging it down. But can you only sharpen one end? Do not go sharpening this corner because this goes under your wrist. Okay, not a good place to have a sharp edge. Now we're going to need one task here. We're going to do V cut in the middle. And those engineers who might be watching and going, this is a center drill technique, exactly. So my little spindle gouge, we can go into the middle, we can drill a hole. You could use a drill bit if you like in the tail stop and your drill chuck takes time. So we have a depth hole. We then want a bowl gouge. I want a pencil line. I guess about there. Okay, it's a rough guide. So I've got 55 mil, my overall there is about 90. So my size work there. Now we're going to use our bowl gouge, quarter inch bowl gouge. So lots of you got this. Um, other weird thing, bowl gouges, you need to pick it up and it needs to feel comfortable, especially for this type of work. I'm doing something that's just quite close quarters, hollowing out. I don't need a lot of leverage for this. So I want something that feels balanced in my hand, easy to pick up. Depending on the size of the handle, will determine what you're doing. If you're doing lots of bowl work, a longer handle is more beneficial. But I grip a lot further up. So depending on where I hold will determine how things feel comfortable. I find this a bit fat for what I'm doing. But I've got this size gouge at home to do my bowls. So just something to think about. Different handle shapes and sizes will play a real part. Now with our gouge, our flute, if it is dead upright, is 12 o'clock. We can use it, one, two, over to three o'clock, it's still useful. Come back into play at nine, back up to 12. For the cut we're now gonna do, we're gonna do a back cut, remove the waist quickly. We're gonna have the gouge on its side, nine and a half, 10 o'clock. We're not gonna rest the bevel. So we cut this, it's almost not written about in the books. Definitely when I started, it wasn't. So we're gonna use that center hole as our access. So I need to get up level that I can get the tip of the gauge in there. Lock it up, finger and thumb. Into there. Right. You've got something coming from. Right. So from centre outwards, we're moving the bolt. Okay, so from the middle, we come all the way out, taking this out. Now we're doing rapid stop removal, really quick and really fast. Don't you get a camera one for me? So we've got lots of chips, quite coarse shavings, okay? quite aggressive as a cut. So that's our back cut from the center. I haven't quite come out to my pencil line. All right, so we haven't come all the way up to the pencil line. We are for um, All right, so we've got our pencil line still there. So we've got our tip. We haven't quite got our shape. All right, so our shape needs a bit of work. We're gonna turn the gouge over. So this time, instead of having the flute over at nine o'clock, nine and a half, we're coming all the way back over. We're gonna line up, we're gonna rest the bevel. So we switch the label, we rest the bevel. So we come inside, handle comes out. So we're resting the bevel inside the edge. So this is all about that finger and thumb. Flute at this stage, one to two o'clock. I can rest the tip of the gouge inside nicely. Come to there. Push round, we're gonna drive round all the way to the middle using the tip, all the way to the center. Hold it there, back in, all the way round again, so we're building our shape. Lots of body movement on this. So again, finger and thumb, I wanna start the cut again. My thumb's telling me what's happening. So rest inside, from there, in behind it, drive round, we're using the tip. Look where the handle's got to come, all the way back to me. 
Okay, then can we do an overhead for me? Camera two. Okay, so let's see if we can do another cut there. So we're from there all the way around. Look at the handle move. Drive our shape all the way around to the middle. Lovely. So, okay, we've hollowed most of our shape. I'm hoping if we go to camera three, fantastic. Oh, good. Got quite a nice clean shape in there. All right, so that look, looks quite good if you like. Let's just see if I can help you just a little bit. So we've hollowed it out, half an egg cup shape, if you like. So I'm going to bring it back round. Now we need to clean that up in a second. So we've done all the hard work. We've got a clean cup. We've rested the bevel on that second cup. Looks really nice. Round nose scraper. So I want to clean this up. Now, I do have a bit of an unusual scraper. And at some point, we're going to get questions. So let's see if we can beat them on this. I have this scraper with a hollow grind. So there, front edge you can see there, turn it over, long grind around the side, hollow grind on the top. Now by hollow grind on the top, in reality, when they make this, they have a little grinding wheel and it comes around the front face. Difficult to hold and show you, but it comes around there. So this grinding pattern, if you look at it, comes out from the center edge. Towards that. So no matter where I look at this, there is a hollow grind coming out towards the cutting face. Long bevel underneath. So when I sharpen this, what do I do? Because obviously you've got that hollow. The only place I really sharpen, I go with my diamond file, is, let's see if we can get it in position. If I've got the new out of the packet. Okay, all right. Good, it's all right. I'm waiting for the burn just to, okay. I can come across the top lightly with a diamond file. I don't want to do too much because I've already done this one. And all I'm doing is polishing that front edge. I'm bridging across that hollow nicely. From then on, I will sharpen at the bevel. So you've got the ground edge. I take my diamond file. I push it up, work around this. Once I kind of think, getting a bit blunt, I want to restore it. What do I do? I put hollow grind back in this like you would normally on your bench grinder and then start again. So the only time this goes back to a bench grinder really is when this becomes nice and flat and straight from lots of diamond file work. The top edge, I don't touch at all with a grinder. So that's factory done straight off the shelf out the packet. So hopefully that will answer some of those people that are going to say, how do you sharpen this? Okay, next little bit then. We're going to clean up the inside. Not bad of a shape. Fingertips tell me what's happening. They're better than my eyes. What's going on? There. Choice wise need to be there. About centre, just above. Lots of you have scrapers. Um, then, can we go to camera one? Go do something weird now. If I ask most people at a club demo where their handle needs to be for a scraper, they will tell me it should be higher. You trail the front edge. Um, with this, I can do this. Okay, so it's got a really sharp edge. I can also, and this is leaving a little bit. There aren't many people that I think that I know, if I can hold this, that can do that with their scraper. So what I'm at, that's actually sharpened up to a really sharp cutting edge with a diamond file. I don't have a beer, it's not aggressive. So in reality, I'm using this from inside. Look at that, lovely controlled shaving. I keep my handle level, up and down the middle, back out. I can work either direction, nice light touches. So this is classed, if you like, as a refinement tool. Up through there, nice and clean. So we've got our nice curved shape, fingertips. I've got a little bit I want to get. Getting fussy. So back into there. Nice and lightly. Back and forwards. The other thing with this long grind all the way around the edge, I don't have to swing my hand around as much. So I'm more in control. If you run my body, I can drag it across, pull it back without having to swing the hand away from my body, leaning out over the light. That should be good. Put that back in there. I'm gonna come do a little bit on the outside now. 
just part of the shape we want. So again, we're going to rest our barrel up with the handle. Going to roll it. So we're resting the bevel on here. We're cutting, taking that round into the last little bit, and then we stop the load. I just want to clean up the parting cut, which this little flat bit. It's not very clean. It'll bounce if I rest the pencil on it. I've gone back to my scraper because this is less aggressive. It's not going to fold the fibres inside where that curve is. It will give me a nice clean finish straight off the tool. Okay, Craig's got another question. Yeah, Ben is asking, uh, are you only able to lift the scraper handle like that because it's a negative rake? Yep, so a negative rake scraper, and I get asked lots of times on how does it make a difference? What does it do? Now, this is factory done. When I first started playing with this, it was something I played around with and ruined two or three scrapers to put the hollow grind in. In reality, you haven't got a cutting tip that's coming flat. You've got a curved knife edge coming up to the front edge. So it gives you a real sharp edge. Like I said, this is actually sharp enough. I can cut paper with it. I don't have a burr because a burr makes it aggressive. It'll bite a bit. So therefore, it gives me a cleaner cut. Now, negative rake scrapers become very popular. I get people say, so how does it change the aspect of, and I ask three people around the world, I know, and i got three different answers. My simple answer, more controllable. It's as simple as that. The fact I can even drop the handle down and hold fingertips, it's less scary. So hopefully that'll give you a bit of an idea. Craig's got another question. Yeah, and Ted has asked, uh, what are the top and bottom angles? That I don't know off the top of my head. And I was looking actually before we came in here. This is actually about a five degree hollow grind on the top. Factory done. Underneath, if actually I measure from the bottom coming up the front with the little angle gauge, it's 80 degrees from what I measure. But I think what we do, can you do us an email? I'll check it out. I'll let you know totally. Okay, I did have a look, but I don't think it's 80 degrees because I'm measuring off the bottom. But I will have a look for you. All right. So it's not that straight in it, but it's quite amazing if you look at... Let's have a look up on here. Ben, get a camera free for me. So, my one. Very different angle. Quite steep. All right, so normal scraper. I know it's different size. A lot more grinding around. But like I said, gives me a real sharp head. The hollow grind, very difficult to get right because you've got to fan out from the front. So, I have had people over the years mess things up. It's easier to buy it off the shelf done and that's a sad way of phrasing it but okay because everything fans out coming from there right so Craig, all right? good so what we've done so far we have our hollow inside as a half an egg cup shape all right so you're on so you can put an egg in if you like i've got a little bit of bead edge on the here tiny flat in between what we haven't got at the moment is where the lid and the base are going to come together this little recess can it do that in a second? But we're going to sand first. So let's move things out the way around here. I want a bit 150 grip. My abrasive. Do a few things. First of all, I've labelled it. I fold it into three. I can grip it, finger and thumb. I've moved the banjo to give me access. Next thing I do, start a lathe. Now we were turning about 2,200. I take the speed down to under seven. Run it slower. The reason for running it slow, I don't want to heat, shake, or crack the material. I can put the extractor on. Just going to bring it in a bit. I go in. Left hand is going to support my wrist, add a bit more strength. Pull it round. We're only really working on that inside, so the 150 won't need too much. I'll do a little bit here. I'm going to blend into where that flat is. We will redo this coming up round when we shape the outside. So 150. Nice and quick. 240, we do exactly the same. We fold it into three. Put it on my finger. Easy to control and grip. Pull it up round. Concentrate on that bit in the middle. Four hundred. Then we've done exactly the same thing, fold it all. Two 
see what's happening. Have a feel. Turn the air off. So, bring the banjo back into play. Next thing we want to do is cut that recess. So where the lid goes onto the base, this is where that skew chisel really comes into play. Wanted something really narrow thickness to go in. If we go with something like the beading tool, it's a lot thicker in section here. So the further in I go, the more you rest across the triangle. And on smaller boxes, it pushes you towards the middle because you make contact on the two edges. So not brilliant for that. Proper oval skew has a flat on one edge. So I've now got a scraper edge on the side and a cutting tip on the front. I want something here that is dead parallel, nice and straight. I'm gonna go into there. Now I'm just gonna bring the light down. I need a bit of light just to see in here for this cut. Hopefully that's not too bad on the camera, that's good. I'm gonna take the live speed up. When we make play with this, I can either use the tip or the side. In this case, I'm going to set how much I want. Speed's creeping up. So I'm going to actually come into the bottom of my cut and using the side of it. Now I can use the tip. I can work backwards and forwards using the tip, clean it up. Other weird thing this, I roll the bar a little bit on the tool rest just to clean our cut. Craig. A couple of questions. Okay. Okay. First one, um, Nigel has had a couple of inch and a quarter screws snap on him when he's attaching um, faceplate to bowl blank. Is there a screw you can recommend? What gauge of screw would be Obviously best? Obviously, you've got to think about the size of what you're putting on the faceplate. Um, the, the deeper the bowl, the bigger the diameter, the more it's going to need a little bit of fixing. Got that kind of choice. Think about how long they need to be. Likewise, if it's a bigger bowl blank, got a lot of weight to it, you might want more screws. So certain bowls we might turn with four screws in because they're smaller. The minute you go up to something a 12 by four, you might want six. Think about is really looking at the size comparative to the, the weight of the bowl blank and what you're fixing it. So think about what it's doing. They're not doing any damage for you when you put them in there. Be better side on that try of caution and make sure you've got a good fix in there and actually put too little in and then have more problems, okay? Hopefully that answers that, give you a bit of an idea of, all right? I'm not gonna say what kind of sizes, whatever. Most of the face plates have a countersunk hole. You've got to think about your size of the screw. Make sure it's thick enough to grip it, okay? And uh, another question. Um, what about sharpening hollow grinds on the kind of pro edge? Not something I've played with. Now we did the ultimate edge last week. We did a sharpening session. And it is one of my questions at the moment of, is a flat be bevel better than a hollow? Now, on my skew, and it was one of the questions actually last week, why didn't I use my skew? Because I want a hollow grind on this skew chisel, purely for the fact of when I come to sharpen it, my diamond file, let's turn our light off, then it can go free. There's our diamond file, my hollow grind. I can bridge across the hollow. So the only bit I'm cutting is the very front and a little bit on the back. You can see the shine on there now, tiny little bit, just from where we've done that. I can also draw this up here, produce a bear on the top. So that hollow grind I really like on this, where it's actually something like the ultimate edge, I won't get a hollow. So something that needs playing around with a little bit. All right, and that isn't giving you a conclusive answer, I know totally. Different people like different things. With my bowl gouges, I want to see if it makes a difference. Is it better to have a flat grind than a hollow? I'm so used to having a bench grinder that just use that. So something to play with, something to explore, I think. Okay, let's go back to our, our recess in here. Now, we cut this. I'm hoping it's nice and straight. I'm getting older. I say it's not as good. So what we're going to do, set of expanding calipers. And this is so worth doing. And when we do this, and I've done teaching in different places, I always have these. So we go into the back. I wind the meal. So they just touch at the bike, grip there. If I pull forward, what happens? I've got a little bit of, bit of grip coming towards the thumb. So we're not quite straight. We're a little bit undercut. We want it to be parallel. So if we go back in, we do exactly the same again. Test it. 
to the back, lock them into their just touching, pull it forward, sensitive touch on the calipers. Okay, I want to do a tiny little bit, back edge. Now this is where this skew chisel really came about from. Doing this cut, I got given some timber when I was in Australia called Mulga, and it's like turning lumps of steel. It broke the tip off. These are a bit better because they have thicker sections, so there's more strength. So the curve on the back is about adding strength to that tip. Check that's nice and clean. Now the reason we've done that recess and actually done it before we sanded was if we sand it and cut the recess first, your fingertip is going to roll this corner edge. I want a nice, crisp, sharp recess. Cellulose sealer. So we've used that before. Thinned about 50-50 with cellulose thinners. Gives me a bit of time to brush it on, wipe off the excess. Just going to friction dry a little bit there. We then want to open the tin of wax. You can use whatever you like. So I've got micro crystal wax. Use this quite a lot. So don't need too much. What we really need is about 10 to 15 minutes to let it sink in. I don't think we're going to do that. So we're going to have a little bit of sawdust. Take the waste out, so that will catch the worst of that wax. So we've done our lid. Got the inside done. Nice shape, nice and clean. Swap them over so that base or the other half goes into there nice and tight. Move a few things about, want those. We want to know how big this recess is inside the lid. Ooh, 58. Half of 58. 25, 29. Okay. Set those up. Now we need to find the middle. Quite simple, we put the label into the centre, take a little V, dividers go into the scratcher line. I want to help you guys see it so it's there. Hang those back up. Go bring the tall rest around to here. Now this is the bit you need to be patient with because first of all, to complete the box, then you go to main camera, I think. So to complete our box, it's got to hold on here to turn, to be gripped, to be shaped. But also have the belief that box lids should fit. They shouldn't be loose, so they should be tight enough, they stay on there. That's quite an important part. So this bit's so important. All those proportions that we said about of two fifths and three fifths can go out the window. So we're going to do our shape then. So we've got our line on the end. We've got depth, I can look at. So free eight feeding tool. We do our peel cut. Quick bulk removal. Hopefully, my maths is any good. Doesn't fit. Got a little bit to go. That's good. Now we're going to change the cut slightly. So Ben, can you go to the overhead camera, I think? When here, we're going to use our beading tool. At the moment, we've done straight cut. Push it forward. I'm actually going to angle the corner up. So my right hand side is going to tilt the tool, resting on the bottom left corner. I'm actually going to pivot it. 
Slice across. One cap. Don't need more than one. I can see I've still got my line. So this is creating a little bit of a taper. So I'll blank on here. Got a taper shape. I'll try and show you in a second. So back to the... A lot of stop start on this bit. Trying to make sure we don't overshoot. Nearly fitting on the front. Starting to fit just on that front lip. Now I'm going to do a bit of light just for me. I want to see where I'm hitting, where I'm not. Just starting to fit. So now we need to square that up. Now what we can do here, I'm going to drop the tool rest down. So that robust rest nicely out the way. Turn this over by hand. I get, I don't know if Ben can see it on the overhead. Shiny surface. Okay. Wonder if we can get it better for Craig. Oh, I hadn't realised I put the chuck on that try. Probably a good thing. So we take this off, we bring it up, get my hand steady. Right on the top edge on here, I turn the wheel around, there's a very slight polished edge. You can see where my pencil is. Just that tiny little bit. Fantastic, all right? So you can see that line. That's why I put the work together, twisted it. It will give us very sharp light shine. So we can use that now as a really good guide of where the fit point is. Bring the light back in so I can see what's going on there. Not too much shadow. My bit of paper helps just do the same. Got a build up in this back corner. So now I'm squaring that face up. So we got our lid to fit. Push it on. It needs to fit tight. Go on there all the way and get on. Can I get it off? That's important. So to help us get this on and off, I'm going to start shaping the base. So clear the cutter, cut it all out of the way. To rest into there. So again, I'm working over the centre stem. Check everything's tight. Left foot's gone back out of the way. So we're using four inch bulb out. We're resting the barrel, cutting larger to smaller. So I have a pink cut all the way down through. Let's bring my body back out the way and move the tail stock a little bit. One more. Already thinking about what we want this shape. Want to keep that a little bit. So I don't know how much that's apparent up on the camera there. Got a tiny little step. Going to use that step in a second. My next job, just to check the lid and base come together. So uh, do this with Craig, I think. It will show you a bit better. Quite an important part to get right. Where the lid and base come together, we want to get the pencil. Make sure that they come together cleanly up in that gap. So everything sits nice and square, positioned nicely, equal all the way around. Really important to look at. Obviously, if it's on the live, you can hold it and look at it quite easy, but it's difficult to show you. So that's why I wanted to take the chuck off so we can see where we are. That little lip we're going to use in a minute that I've left, that's going to create a little bead. That fits on and off, okay? It goes all the way up. If it doesn't go all the way up, what can it be? We haven't altered the top of here. It might not be cut quite square. You might put it in the chuck slightly out of square. 
might be too long. So we'd need to measure the length of our spigot. So our vernier, we'd measure there. We check our depth. Check those, make sure they're okay, about the same. Great, what do you got? Uh, Frog Fella is asking um, if removing that bulk of waste will alter the fit at all. So, with this being nice and dry, it shouldn't actually affect how this is going to work. It shouldn't go too much to an oval. This is spindle work, so it will be quite good. If you went with a bowl blank and tried to make a box, it will shrink to an oval shape. Okay, so at the moment, this is kind of fitting nicely. What will affect it a little bit, and it fits really tight at the moment, is going to be when we hollow the inside. It's going to get to in a second. So, part of the reason for doing what we've done here allows me to get my fingers in behind to push this off. If I'd left this as a big block, there's no way of getting my fingertips in behind there. So, the lid's going to go back on. We want to shape our lid. Going to use, Ben, can we go camera one, please? Going to use something now as a magic lid fitting solution to go on here. All right, so a little bit of tang oil, put that on there. I might regret it. But if you've got a loose fitting lid, it's a way of a little bit of moisture. The other way of doing this can be a piece of paper towel, kitchen paper, one layer. Not all of this folded up. If you've got all of this folded up, you need to take that spigot off, redo it, cut another one. So we've got our lid on there. I'm going to shape the outside of our lid now. Set that up. A little bit of light. Going to take that down to there. So our bowl gills. Tip of the girls, working larger to smaller. Place this up towards the point. And around the corner here, starting to build all my shape really. Now, I want to have a look inside. Got to take it off, fingertips. Inside here, gauge your thickness. We've got a big hollow bit in here. It's easy to forget about it. So we want to make sure, get your fingers in. That feels good. Still got a bit. Push it back on, check it runs true. That's good. Back in. So, relock everything down, rest the bevel. Tip of the down, so we've got a 55 degree bevel on here, same as Colwyn uses. So we can use the tip, I'm only using the very middle, keeping the wings out the way. So flute, about one o'clock, just trying to pick that little bit up. Just going to bring that round to there. Craig's got another question. Yeah, another question from Frogfella. He missed the beginning. What size of bowl gauge do you prefer? This is a quarter-inch bowl gauge. Now, weirdly, today, we've already used two things that are exactly the same in reality. Quarter-inch bowl gauge, quarter-inch spindle gauge. They are very different. To measure the width of the flute on a bowl gauge, you measure the internal that they grind into this. So, in other words, my little spindle gouge will fit inside. Hopefully that will clear up by it. So quarter inch bowl gouge, quarter inch spindle gouge. Craig, you got another? And yeah, uh, a question from Simon. What speed are you turning at right now? So this at the moment is running about 2,200. All right. So I can turn these quite fast. All right. So 2,000 and uh, 2,420. Okay. So I can use the lathe speed to generate the cut. I work less to do that, if that makes sense. So the lathe is doing the work, not so much me. Got a nice point on the lid. All right with your questions? Up to, okay. I'm just going to finish this little bit on the lid. Got to bring those two curves together. Doesn't quite show. I want to match this in. Now I've got my oval skew. Now I'm going to shear scrape. So this is held at a 45 degree angle. We're not resting the bevel at all. 
Um, something I got told off four years ago, but I'm not the only one there that does this. My left thumb works incredibly hard just to support this. Come around there, checking where we are in the chuck. I'm going to take that underside, blend that in. All right, so we're not resting the bevel at all. And I deliberately used that there that we put on top with the diamond file earlier to make sure okay. that gives us something. Then can we get a free? Nice, clean shape. All right. Hopefully that looks good. Now we're going to put that aside for a minute now because we need to get back onto the base. Let's just finish off that little lump we left. I need to get into there. Now I'm going to get myself in trouble now. So I just want to do a little bead. So the little bead I'm going to do with a fluted parting tool. I'll raise this up and down. The lazy man's way of cutting a bead. That gives me repetitive beads when I want them. Fingertips will tell me how this feels. That adds my brake line. Then you can go to free. Craig. Yeah, just a quick question from Brian. He's had a good go at doing this sort of thing and doing the lids, but when, when he takes them in, indoors, they always end up seeming a bit a little bit loose. The timber's nice and dry. So that paramount, like I said at the beginning of the demo, this has got to be seasoned. Um, the lids will loosen a little bit, but if you think, both bits of wood are shrinking. So the lid will shrink onto the base. So everything will keep that accuracy of how tight it is. The major thing really is getting the wood seasoned before you start. Got to be dry. All right, so hopefully that answers that one, okay? Right then, so we've just cut our little bead. Now, the reason I said this will get me into trouble, I've used a fluted parting tool, something we don't actually sell, a bit unusual. Um, a couple of people make them, not every company make them because they are difficult to do. So this is an Ashley Isles one. So if you live in the UK, worth contacting Ray and Ashley to see about, okay, they do those. Ashley Isles still make this. This is a free mill, okay? The guys that live in the States, D-Ray Tool do some nice ones. So again, you'd be able to buy an eighth of an inch over there. So sadly, something we can't sell you, I'm sorry. We're gonna hollow the inside of the base. First thing I wanna do, level off the topper here. At the moment, this has got a little bit of bounce because of where we got that parting cut. Just the bevel. Weird grip now, I'm gonna grip down the tool rest. I'm in behind, nice and safe. Why do this? It gives me a way of pushing things forward nicely without actually having to bring my elbow into my body. Rest the bevel. Then you could go to camera one, I think. Go to there, now I've got lots of room for all of this. Into there, come back, find the chip, push it forward. There you go, Ben, you can change the camera. All right, lots of clearance. Very unusual with the grip, but it works nicely. It means I'm not all hunched up. So we've just leveled the top, create our V, a bit similar now to when we did the lid, I want a depth. So I set my depth gauge up, that's that. I then want the quarter inch spindle gouge, need to go into the middle. Drill our hole. A little bit more to go. Check we're down to a okay. All the way down to the base. Set our depth line. I'm going to hollow the inside of the base. Now, I want this to be a square interior, unlike the lid that's half round. Finger and thumb. Bow gauge on its side again into that hole. Left arm's going to come across the top. Bolt removal. Gonna change my gouge, quarter inch bowl gouge, slightly shorter flute, older gouge if you like, because it won't shatter as much. Well. 
Now I said to you, this is all about quick bulk removal. I've had people say, could you not do this with a drill bit? I'd still be looking for the right size drill. Craig, we got. Yeah, just a quick question from Kevin. Um, do you not find that you get tear out using that fluted beading tool? As long as you're nice and light with it and you don't force it. Now, the other weird thing I did with that was also have the handle low. Well, force it. Now, this is different to what you might be thinking you get in the UK because the flute is on the bottom. Not a half round ground in the front flat section. So, ground up through here. Sharpened like a parting tool I sharpen upside down on the bench grinder. Gives me two little spurs, little diamond file. Craig? And yeah, a uh, question from Frogfeller again. Um, would you, would roughing out the project first, leaving it for a bit, help it help it settle and kind of help the fit later on? I have a pile of boxes that I roughed out at home about 15 years ago, and my box design shape has changed so much that now I kind of look at them and go, can't get the shapes out that I want. So you can rough them out. If you've got something that's part season or you get something wet, yes, you could rough them out. Some people will even take the log down to a cylinder and then seal the ends. So yes, you can do. It's that thing called patience, isn't it? Making sure you get something that's dry. And I can understand what you're looking at. Yes, you can rough them out. Um, I used to tape them together with solid tape so you know that which lid fitted, because you might have a batch of four or five you want to do. So it can be worth doing. It can speed it up. All right. We're now going to clean up inside of the base so we've taken all that bulk out quite quickly quite aggressively in ways so in here get my fingers in i can see where we are i've got a tiny little bit of the hole in the middle still to get a bit ridgy down the side i want to clean that up so i'm going to use another scraper a bit weird again so this has and this is another negative rake scraper this has, in reality, is based on a bidan, which is a French-style parting tool. But this one, Craig, you might want to drop, just drop back a little bit. The reason I cut my bit of card out, it's one of these questions that I regularly get. So if I take the chisel and we magnify it in section down the length, it is that shape. So it has a taper on the outside edge where I'm cutting, a hollow grind on the top, square side here. That's all about adding more strength. A true be down would have a double taper both sides, but never have this top grind. So the top grind I've got on here is hollow. That comes out towards the outside edge. So again, it's ground this way. Coming out, there's a hollow grind on the top. So that gives me the aspect of how we can use this for a cut. It will cut down the side, across the bottom. The most important bit with this, it has a curved corner. If you have a square corner, it will bite when you join those two surfaces. So otherwise, the bottom and the side. So that little curve, quite important. This is going to allow me to clean this up using the side. Now, I brought my tool rest up. I want to be down just a little bit into there. So I can test it on the side. I come down the side. Just five in the bottom. Trying a bit high now. I need to be cutting at nine o'clock or just above on the workpiece. Into the middle, I come out. So now I'm working across the bottom. All the way out to the edge. So I'm looking down through, making sure where things are, cleaning up. I'm just looking at the bottom of the drill hole we made with the spindle gouge. Just going to have a quick look and feel. Want a bit more out the side here, a little bit in the bottom to blend in. So back in, hand on the top. So we're trying to get something nice and straight down through. All we want to do now is reduce the thickness. So a 
little bit noisier with that. I'm sorry. Okay. So that feels good. Light cleanup. So really important tool for me that another one of these weird things though. So where are we? Can be free. We look good. Too sharp in this. With her, you can see the hollow grind down through. Unless you want to get out of the packet, diamond file, a couple of swipes down that hollow grind just to put a shine edge on the outside. I don't want loads. Just trying to see. Let's just see if I turn this off and we might be getting too much reflection off there. So you can see the hollow grind there. So diamond file, just a little bit, a couple of swipes down there just to take a little teeth mark out the outside edge. Then I sharpen this outside edge, and you can see where I've sharpened it. Polished it up, diamond file, get a nice sharp corner on here. That's so important. To sharpen the front edge, we do the hollow across the top. I can push up the bevel to do the opposite one. I can also work around that corner to make sure I get a curve. So to do the curve, and even look there, I pull it around that corner, up the diamond file, to create that little corner. That looks good. Last bit I just want to do, just looking and feeling. Just that top edge where it opens. It's going to soften it. And then we're going to do the sanding. Now, we haven't done the sanding so far on the lid. We left that. We didn't want to put heat into that when we started. So we need our lid back as well. We're going to do inside the base. Again, your 700, good guide for your speed. I've moved the banjo out of the way to give us good access. Right. Okay. So we're going to do inside here. I work across the bottom. I can bend the abrasive, bring it out to the side, up the edge. Curve of it. Let's just take that off where I put this on. We can answer Craig's question, hopefully. So we've done 150 in there. Craig? Yeah, so Carl's asked, um, is he correct in thinking that you are modifying normal tools, or are these... Those are tools that are nailed straight off the shelf. In reality, give you the scenario, I did a trip many moons ago to the States. I met a guy out there who owned Henry Taylor Tools in the UK who saw what I was doing and looked up and said, I'd love to make your tools. So... They are straight off the shelf, factory grind on those, and the skew. So they are factory done. We sell them. We even sell that as a set of three. All right, so if you were looking at buying them, try and buy it. If you want it all free, they do it as a set. It's slightly cheaper, so that's something to think about. But they are factory done. All right. Uh, and a, a message from, a oh, question from Simon. Is it the speed of turning that allows you to remove so much material, the tool, or the skill? In reality, the speed is allowing me to remove the material quicker. All right, but there's this thing, obviously, with speed and control. Um, I kind of joke when I started doing this this afternoon, I've been doing this since I was 12 years old. So, sadly... Got a little bit of experience, a bit like Halwyn. We both got quite a lot of experience in putting, so I know what I'm doing with a chisel. I know how to present it. Speed, if things go wrong and you've got the speed higher, it's a bit like motor racing. The crashes are more spectacular the faster the speed. So it's a case of getting yourself familiar with how the tools work. Also, the tools have got to be sharp. Now, I will tell you before we come and do anything in any of the rooms, we have a setup period where we try and make sure everything is ready. Obviously, there's nothing worse than coming into here and things not being sharp or ready to go. So hopefully that gives you a guide. But it's a case of getting familiar with what you're working with, understanding how it works. If you run something too slow on the lathe, though, it becomes hard work because you've got to push more. So it's that balance between the two. All right, so we'll put our air back on. Now we want to sand outside. When I do our B. I can even open the abrasive out to get into there. We need to do our lid. 
Now, the lid actually fits on a bit easier than it did earlier because we've taken the bolt out the middle on the inside. Now, the reason for sanding like we are is putting heat into this at the same stage. And you're going to go, what do you mean heat? A brace of paper generates heat. So this is the 150 grit. Anything I need to get rid of, I need to do with this. So bad tool marks, dents. Anything that I don't like has got to be lost with the 150. My fingers are working nice and hard, feeling what's going on. So now we're going 240. Now 240 grit will actually generate more heat and a bit quicker as well. So hence the fact that 150 is a better grit to do the hard work because it will generate less heat. We've taken the lid off. Inside, we've already sanded 150 inside. The one place we haven't sanded at the moment is this spigot where the lid and base fits together. It needs to fit tight. So at the moment, we're going to leave it tight. Now, if you wanted a loose fitting lid, now is the time in a minute you can do that. Once you've finished all this sanding of the major components, the lid and the base, then yes, you could loosen that lid. So 400. Round our bead, back on, our lid back on, got to do the 400 here, bring it round, so the cellulose sealer. So we brush it on, we grab our blue paper towel, we wipe off the excess, again do this with the lathe not running, You've got the lathe running, it goes everywhere, don't have to mess up your safety glasses. So if you wanted a loose fitting lid, now's the time you can sand a little bit off that spigot, up on here. Um, I can't do that, I, I was... Uh, Brought up, if you like, with a little bit of a guy that was a major mentor, a guy called Ray Key. Um, I can remember reading one of Ray's books, and a loose fitting lid is a sign of shoddy workmanship. We need a little bit. Hence the fact I've grabbed the abrasive. So, it's going to take a tiny bit, 400 grit, off of there. Wanted to see what the sealer was going to do, swell the fibres. Tiny bit. Hence the fact we're just going with the 400 to raise those fibres up. A bit of sealer. Wipe it off. Put that out of the way. Put the lid back on so it doesn't evaporate. We want our wax. Clean bit of tissue to put the wax on with. Now we're only going to put the wax on the inside. Ideally, it'd be nice to give it a little bit of time just to settle in. Needs a bit of time to dry normally the wax. Better to leave it. That's that thing where you go and have a cup of tea. It's nice and clean. move a few things about now we only wax the inside so we're going to change now i'm just doing my little bit of prep change to a scrap block because we've got to get rid of that can't leave that well i can't i'm going to bring this up we won't we hung those up back on there Calipers, dividers, skew chisel, we need bowl gouge as well. So first cut, we're just going to level the top of my scrap block. This has got a bandsaw cut. Clean it off, get it back to flat. We need to find the middle. We're then going to measure a bit there. 
should be the same as what we had earlier. So 58, so 29 on there. Can bring them in a little bit. Find our center. Now, if I'm doing this at home, I would do a batch of boxes and then start with the smallest one coming out to the largest. Cut a recess coming from centre outwards. So in reality, we're making another lid. Still got our line, so that's a good scribe line where we need to be. A little bit of light just to illuminate what I'm trying to see. That skew chisel just to square that face up a little bit more. So skew chisel. Tilting it on the tool rest just fractionally so we can use the side edge, that flat edge of that oval skew. Nice straight edge. Gives us a parallel cut. Tapers a little bit towards the base. Now I want magic lid fitting solution. That needs to fit, needs to be tight. This is going to be a shock. Get running through. On, cool that off, look. Take our speed back up, left hand. And I've got the tourist now angled diagonally across that face. A little bit. Now you could bring your tail stuck up. But I've made sure that fits nice and tight. So we're using tip of the gouge again, blending into that spigot. Listen to what's happening as it can't not too much for. Allow the tool to run. Fingertips now. Well, we've got, got a change of direction about there. So I tip the gown towards the middle. If I raise or lower the handle, we can hit that tip. Smack on, right in the middle. All the way to the centre. Find our abrasive. One, two, that one there. Remove your tool rest. Now, I'd put a curve on here. You can have a flat. You can have a flat in the centre. Some of you won't like the curves. Try, try, give us a flat. Right? So, then take my speed down. I've taken the tool rest out. A bit of sharp edge up on there, we do that. Grab our 240 grip. Four hundred. Just to add a little bit of interest on the base, a couple of lines, a bit of sealer. You can see why I like this laburnum now with that colour change, that light and that dark. Go on then, Craig. So, from Frogfella, um, as a box maker, Jason, I'm sure you've heard of two fits Russian and French. Is there a third one, Yorkshire, a uh, Yorkshire fit where you can work out the sequence? Um, I dread to think how many boxes I've actually made, so I have a set sequence for style of box. In case of working through, figuring out how your lid and base are going to fit together, or all those sort of things. So it takes a little bit of thinking about. Um, if you start looking on my website and stuff, you'll start seeing there's some boxes that kind of go, that even turned? So quite a shock on. So yes, I have quite a good sequence, which is quite well, I suppose, ironed out, quite repetitive to do. 
So I hope that gives you a bit of an idea, yeah? Okay, so we're gonna polish the outside. At the moment we polish the inside with the wax and the sealer. So pigtail, really throw it in. Can be worth, I haven't got one here, we use this, you use the emergency bits of wood that we didn't need. Tap that in, make sure it's, all right? So this is something that we've done, Colwyn I know's done. Want to make that outside shine. So polishing mops. We've got actually mainly a dark colour wood. We've got a little bit of sap wood. So we're going to go stitch mop, wind that on. Dark compound. Most important thing, I've tapped that in place, held it. A little bit of compound. Don't need a lot. So the brown compound we're using because we're using a darker wood. Hold on to this. I'm only going to do the base. The lid we can do later. Fingertips. At home, I've even got a plastic box with bubble wrap, but I sit on the lay bed when I polish the boxes because you don't want this thrown around the room. So you need to support it. Work different directions. So this is acting as a cutting agent. Cuts the back that raised grain off the sealer. Change the mop. Like I said, the, the lid I can do later. Loose mop, unstitched. Carnuba wax, and it needs to be pure carnuba. So, Colwyn's demo the other week on the wood finishing. Really good example of using that. We can go across the base. Now, the reason for doing this is a finish. It gives me a hard wearing finish that lasts. People pick up, pull the boxes apart, put them down. This will keep that shine. Anything like a friction polish will get drawn in. A lacquer, difficult to apply and get equal and no runs. Make sure the lid still fits. All those things become problematic. So the buffing wheel system, those three compounds, the white compound, the pale, better for really light wood. So holly, sycamore, maple, the brown, most of those with a bit of colour. The loose mop your final gloss. Now the other nice thing with this is you can redo that at any point. So if it goes a bit dull, yes, you can easily rejuvenate it. You can just buff it back up. Let's change our picture. Move that out. Take that out to there. No, I did say. So we can grab its table. Well, it goes together. I've got rounded base. Why? Um, I used to have toys when I was a kid called Weebles. Weebles wobble, but they won't fall over. So for some weird reason, someone at the demo said, got to have a flat bottom. Why? I actually quite like that. I like the fact it's got a bit of movement, moves about. So we've got our base, nice and cleanly done. Got our shape. You can see the difference, I think, probably on camera. If you look at the difference in the shine from where we buffed it, just the sealer. So that buffing compound gives you a real nice glossy finish. Those two little knots we said about wanted in the base, shut beautifully down in there. So we have our box, hopefully. I think you've enjoyed it. Craig, you got any more questions? Anything else? No? So guys, hopefully you've enjoyed it. Um, we're taking a bit of time. We're right. We're good. Tomorrow, Craig's going to look at planers and thicknesses with you. So give you an idea of what they are, how they work, what they do, all those sort of things. If you've got questions on those, let us know. On Thursday, I'm sharpening some garden tools because summer's here. It is. Cut winds on holiday. Summer's here. So thanks very much. We'll see you tomorrow. Another woodworking wisdom. Bye.